Brian here with the second video of the Buddha's Eightfold Path. Let's jump right into it because this one is a little long. Uh, the second is Right Thought. So, also called Right Intention and Right Resolve. What is Right Thought exactly? Uh, Bonta G puts it into perspective uh, pretty well in his book. Uh, connecting, Kind of connecting Right uh, Thought. To right understanding, he says, fantasies, fears, and other kinds of obsessional thinking are a big problem for us. We all tend to lock into unhealthy thought patterns, grooves we have worn into our consciousness that keep us circling in familiar tracks leading to unhappiness. The second step of the Buddhist path offers us an escape from this pattern, a way of redirecting our thoughts in positive and helpful directions. When we begin to understand things rightly, through mindfulness of the key points of the first step of the path, our mind naturally flows into skillful thinking. Thinking here refers not only to thoughts, but any intentional mind state. So as you can see, right understanding helps us lead into right thought. You know, it helps us to shift the, you know, the conditioned mental states we've, you know, cultivated over, you know, our lifetime or lifetimes. Um, to act in a more skillful way that will help end our suffering. So right thought is broken down into three components that we'll look at. Uh, the first one is generosity, also called renunciation, also known as letting go. Uh, loving kindness, also sometimes called loving friendliness, and then compassion. Um, so let's look at the first one, generosity, letting go, renunciation. Uh, this is the opposite of craving, of attachment. So you see those three, the three causes of suffering. The first one is attachment. This is the opposite. This is generosity, letting go. Um, the best, the best way to start cultivating generosity is by giving away material things. Um, you know, there are there are other ways to be generous with non-material things. You know, thoughts time, actions, energy, whatever. Uh, but material renunciation is generally, you know, looked at as the easiest first step onto a, uh, into renunciation. Um, I recently heard a wonderful Dharma talk by one of my favorite Dharma talkers, uh, Dharma teachers, Gil Fransdal, on his Audio Dharma podcast, um, in which he discusses renunciation. And he, you know, he brings up the point that we kind of have this negative view of renunciation, you know. It seems such, like such a grave responsibility to renounce things. And to let go, like, oh, I need to get rid of all this stuff, you know. And, you know, simplifying is a, can be a really positive, useful thing. But we... We do not need to live an ascetic life. Um, and even the Buddha says, you know, there's a fine line between, you know, generosity and asceticism. The Buddha, before his enlightenment, was an ascetic. He only had, you know, I mean, monks, monks in general only have, you know, their robes and their uh, alms bowl. But, you know, the Buddha's like, I can't even eat anything. You know, the stories say he ate a grain of rice a day and he almost died of starvation until he realized, wait a minute. You know, there's a point to eating. So, you can't, you know, it's there's a middle way. The Buddha taught the middle way. You know, not, you know, avoid a hedonistic lifestyle, but avoid, like, pure asceticism. Um, and Gil Franzel likes to use the phrase opening up uh, in regards to renunciation and I think this is a really beautiful uh, a beautiful analogy he said he used a coin but I'll use this rock so you have a rock in your hand right you're clinging to it you're attached to it so if you were to be if you were to try to develop an aversive type of letting go the only thing that'll happen is you'll drop it. Okay? That's kind of a detachment. We don't want to detach. We want to unattach. So how do we do that? 
we open up and by doing so we can be with whatever we're clinging to it can we can be there with it without pushing it away without dropping it um so opening up allows us to have that freedom to have that relief to have that release without clinging to whatever it is we're clinging to um he also uses uh this this analogy and i don't know if it's a traditional analogy in buddhism or not but i think it really hits the nail on the head and he talks about these monkey traps they have you know in the eastern jungles uh where they'll take a coconut they'll drill a hole in it and put a treat for the monkey inside just the holes just small enough for their hand to fit through so they fit their hand through grab the treat and it can't get out they the holes too small for their fist and so they they you know stand there stuck and howling and the trappers will come along and the monkey's defenseless he can't get away but all he has to do is let go you know open up and he can slide his hand through and get away but because of the clinging you know mind the monkey cannot even fathom like that's not just not an option he has a treat he's gonna keep it even if he dies uh, so just open up pull your hand from the coconut uh, the second component uh, after renunciation or generosity is letting go or that is generosity loving kindness uh when we when we let go of negative unskillful states of mind uh we naturally open ourselves up to positive states of mind cultivating positive states of mind loving kindness is one of them uh in in poly in the in the poly language it's called meta uh loving kindness sometimes called loving friendliness and Bonte G uh, describes it very well in his book. He says, uh, It is a warm wash of fellow feeling, a sense of interconnectedness with all beings. Because we wish for peace, happiness, and joy for ourselves, who doesn't? We know that all beings must wish for these qualities. That's loving kindness. That's it's a sense of connection with all beings, with the idea that we're all looking for love and peace and happiness. Um, how can we actively cultivate love and kindness? Uh, there's the popular metta meditation, where you will start with yourself, because the Buddha said, you know, no one's more worthy of your of love and kindness than yourself, right? So you start with yourself, you know, may I have, may I be peaceful, may I be at ease, may I be healthy, may I be happy. Then you can, you know, practice love and kindness for a loved one, a friend, uh, then a neutral person, a stranger, someone you don't know, and then your enemy. That's, that's pretty powerful. Loving kindness for your enemy. I mean, how does that work? And so there's something I want to read from Bontage's book about wishing loving kindness for your enemy. And he says, In practical terms, the best thing I can do to assure my own peace and happiness is to help my enemies overcome their problems. If all my enemies were free of pain, dissatisfaction, affliction, neurosis, paranoia, tension, and anxiety, they would no longer have reason to be my enemies. Once free of negativity, an enemy is just like anyone else, a wonderful human being. I mean, what kind, what powerful, you know, idea that is to wish, you know, happiness for your enemy. You know, in this day and age, we're wishing death and firebombs on our enemy instead of saying, you know, I, I, I hope they actually, you know, get to the point where they're happy and it's not you know oh I you know I wish they're successful in destroying me because you know from this point of view we already know that that's not gonna bring them happiness what we can do 
you know, is exactly this, is exactly practice love and kindness for them. Because if they were to be truly happy, they wouldn't need to destroy you. Um, and this brings up the point of anger. Now, anger is, you know, a, a very difficult hurdle to get over in reaching loving kindness. And in a way, this is uh, loving kindness combats anger. Anger is kind of like the opposite of it. And I mean, wh what what do we do with anger? The the best antidote, according to Bhante G, is patience. And he tells a story from the Samyutta Nikaya, uh, of another volume of the Pali Canon. Um, a very popular story, I'll tell you here now, uh, about patience in the face of anger. So once there was a Brahmin, a person of high rank and authority, this Brahmin had a habit of getting angry, even for no reason. He quarreled with everyone. If someone else had wronged and did not get angry, the Brahmin would get angry at the person not getting angry. He's that angry. Uh, the Brahmin had heard that the Buddha never got angry. One day he went to the Buddha and abused him with insults. The Buddha listened compassionately and patiently. Then he asked the Brahmin, Do you have any friends or family or relatives? The Brahmin replied, Yes, I have many friends and relatives. Do you visit them periodically? The Buddha asked. Of course I visit them often. Do you carry gifts for them when you visit them? Surely, I never go to see them without a gift, said the Brahmin. The Buddha asked, When you give them gifts, suppose they, they do not accept them. What would you do with these gifts? I would take them home and enjoy them with my family, answered the Brahmin. Then the Buddha said, Similarly, friend, you gave me a gift. I do not accept it. It is all yours. Take it home and enjoy it with your family. The man was deeply embarrassed. He understood and admired the Buddha's compassionate advice. So as you can see, you don't have to accept insults and things that make you angry. Instead, be patient with the hardships that usually lead to anger. You know, as the Buddha said, don't accept them. You don't have to accept them. It's not yours. It doesn't have to be yours. And that's that's really a you know patience like that is really a really good antidote to just quash anger right there. Uh, the third con component is compassion. Um, compassion as well as loving kindness is can be seen as the opposite of aversion, as we just saw. Loving kindness is a, the opposite of anger. Uh, compassion can be said. Uh, quoting Bhante G here, to be the melting of the heart at thought of another suffering. Uh, com compassion spontaneously follows uh, love and kindness when you cultivate it. Um, and we can cult cultivate compassion for ourselves and for others. And this will really help, uh, help soften the heart. Um, and when in meditation, when negative thoughts arise, one of the best things to do is just watch them. As I said, you know, open yourself up and just be there with it. And and generally what would happen is that they fade. They fade away. Um, their strength just wanes and they just kind of melt away. They fade away. And that, that you know, that's that can be said to be impermanence right there in conclusion right thought uh, revolves around cultivating uh, generosity you know renunciation letting go uh, loving kindness and compassion I guess I'll see you for the third video on right speech uh, thank you for watching and may you have happy thoughts